Hello everyone, in today's video we're going to be taking a look at the beginning of our little Zero to A series. We're going to start by basically setting up a simple mission, walking you through how to fly the AC-52 in the most basic of ways, and then we're going to go move our way on to other videos that are going to go into a little bit more about navigation, a little bit more about handling. And of course, uh, for those of you who are interested in following along, uh, currently the folks over at Eagle Dynamics are offering a free to try, so I'm certainly welcome to try this aircraft. So first things first, uh, we set up a super basic mission here. Uh, we're sitting over here. This is our aircraft. This is the Yak-52. We're being starting over here at Parking 24. This is Krasnodar Center. And again, we're going to be going all the way over here to Novorysk, which is going to be a pretty easy a little flight for us. But there is one thing we're going to want to do on our way here. Uh, we're going to experiment a little tiny bit with the ADF so we can get a little bit of navigation practice in here. And one of the things we're going to be needing to do is tell our ADF system on board the aircraft what our default ADFs are. We don't have a way to tune it, which is a little different. And I noticed when I come over here to the Krimsk that we have an 803 for an inner marker and we have a 408 for an outer marker. So I'm actually going to dial these two in to make our lives a little bit simpler here. So I'm going to go over to this little button. Again, I've already placed these aircraft here. I'm going to go start by typing a 408 for the outer marker. For the inner marker, I'm going to go ahead and do 803. We're going to make our way down to Novorysk. And unfortunately, we have no ADF here at all. So the last part of our flight here, we're actually going to have to do it the old-fashioned way, so to speak, and actually navigate across the mountains. But we'll be taking advantage of all the things that DCS have to offer us so that we can actually go ahead and do that. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, here we are. Before we touch anything in DCS, we need to make sure our controls are going to be set up correctly. Uh, one of the most common things that people complain about DCS, and they're not wrong, is the fact there are a tremendous number of buttons. But the good news is we don't have to set up all the buttons. The most important thing for us is making sure the axes are set correctly, and then we have some ability to trim the airplane, which is going to be something that we care about. There's also a couple other little challenges with this particular aircraft, and uh, we'll get into that. And again, that's why we want to start with this for those of you who are brand new to DCS. Like I said, later on we'll take a look at the intermediate. So I'm going to press escape, press adjust controls. I'm going to go up to the top, and I'm just like Yak-52 Sim. Now, there's a couple different controls you're going to need to set. The first one we're going to be interested in is going to be the engine RPM. If you do not have a handle for this on your joystick somewhere, we can actually program the engine RPM using a button, or we can even use the mouse for it. But this is a very common one that I do set. Coming down here, or naturally, we're going to need something for pitch. To set pitch, we simply double click on it, grab the joystick, and wiggle it back and forth. In this case, it's already set to Y, but make sure the column that you're selecting is the actual device you're going to be using. And we're going to be interested in roll, of course, and rudder is not critical. If you have a twist joystick, definitely program it. If you do not, it's going to be a little interesting for you. I actually have a separate device connected to this particular joystick that gives me the ability to control the rudder on here. If you have auto rudder selected from the realism options, you're going to find that this is still necessary to control yourself on the ground, but it's not absurd. Another thing I really, really like to have here is I like to have my throttle. Obviously, without your throttle, you're going to have issues. Make sure it has been inverted correctly. Otherwise, uh, you're going to have all sorts of fun problems, but I'll show you how to check for that. Coming down to wheel brakes, um, I happen to have an analog lever on the front of my stick, which gives me the ability to do wheel brakes. Notice there's no left and right wheel brakes. There's only wheel brakes. This is a Soviet-style aircraft, so it's going to have a slightly different one. I should say Russian, not necessarily Soviet. Although the handbrake method does show up in other countries as well. Fortunately for us, the C-101 has traditional brakes, as does the F-16, but we'll take a look at that when we get there. Other buttons we're going to be interested in are going to be for setting our radiators. Now, this particular aircraft, again, this is a little different for folks who are a little new to these kind of things, is that we don't have an automatic radiator on here. We can actually overheat this engine and actually burn up the oil, too, if we're not careful. So to control that, I actually built two buttons for it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to scroll down to engine controls. And you'll notice I have a button here for opening the cowl flaps, and I have a button for closing the cowl flaps. It is not critical that you have these buttons bound. It's just one of those things that I find myself tweaking enough that I know I'm going to need it. Not only do I have this button for our, our cow flaps here, I also have a button for our oil radiator flaps. This is a separate system on board this aircraft. And it's one of those things that, yeah, you can set it one way and kind of forget about it, but don't be surprised if you're going to have to come back and play with it a little later on. The next control I always buy, no matter what aircraft is, is going to be your pitch trim. In this case, every aircraft is a little different as far as uh, setting pitch trim. One of the tricks that I've learned is if you come up here and type in the word trim, it will give you all the different options as far as trim. Then you simply bind it. No matter what aircraft you're flying in DCS, you always want to want to go ahead and bind your trim. If you can do aileron trim in addition to regular trim, your life will be much, much better. This aircraft doesn't have aileron trim, so we don't have that ability. But in the C-101 and especially the F-16, you're really going to want to be able to do the aileron trim as well to control that roll rotation that you're going to see. Remember, with this aircraft, we can actually preset the trim instead of our special options. It gives us the ability to actually kind of control it a little bit better. But again, it depends on how fast we're going to be cruising. 
the other button I like to bind as well is going to be to open up the communication menu. In this particular case, uh, we're simply going to press the slash key to open that up. If you want a specific button for it, I've also done that as well. And again, it depends on the airplane. It depends on if you play multiplayer. Do I need to tell my teammates to do things? These are all issues we're going to take a look at in a great amount of detail a little later on. I'm not going to worry about that too, too much today. Other controls we want to, and again, you can do this on the keyboard if you need to. I actually have an option for my landing gear. Uh, the landing gear on this aircraft is a little funky, and you're going to see this on Russian airplanes all the time, where you have multiple positions and landing gear lever. It's not just up down. And we'll see that, of course, like I said, a little later on. So I have one that puts the gear down more. I have one that puts the gear up more. Another button I always like to bind is going to be your landing flaps. Again, for things like the F-16, landing flaps don't really matter. Your speed brake matters, but we'll deal with that once we get over to the C-101. You'll understand exactly why when we get to that particular point as well. Of course, uh, everybody likes to have a button that shoots the guns, but there are no guns on this particular aircraft because it is a training plane. Now, the last thing I want to show you about setting the controls for this plane, and this goes for anything you're doing in DCS, is you're going to want to take a look at the curves. So if I go ahead and open up this uh, pitch curve, for example, by right-clicking and pressing two no axis, you're going to see that just like we have in other flight simulators, we have the ability to have our raw input, which is this needle, in our actual output that's going to our controls. In this case, I'm giving this thing a pretty aggressive little tug here, and I can see very clearly how much authority that I have on this particular one. In this case, I'm noticing that I've got most of my pitch authority here. Now, if I wanted to, I could actually come in here and adjust the curvature. If I go this way, I make my controls less sensitive. If I go this way, I make my controls more sensitive. So it's important that you set the controls and a sensitivity that's comfortable for you. A lot of times aircraft, uh, especially very, very, very sensitive ones with very tiny joysticks, like the little desktop joysticks, you're going to be in a situation where you're going to want a lot of curvature to not make yourself insane. You also, of course, have the ability to invert your controls if you need to here as well. So now that that's all set, I'll go ahead and take a look. I think everything looks good. Pitch is good. Rudder is good. We're going to push the OK button. Go ahead and give everything a control and make sure it's working exactly the way you expect it to. If it doesn't, uh, don't be surprised. But again, like I said, this is a good time to make sure everything is ready to go. OK, let's go ahead and get this thing started. Despite what a lot of people probably think, this is actually a very easy aircraft to start. It's only got a couple little things that you kind of got to watch out for to make things interesting. So we're going to go do a left to right kind of setup here. Our first thing we're going to do is we're going to come up to the back handle. Many Russian aircraft use pneumatics in order to uh, run a lot of their controls. So all we're going to do is we're going to click, drag to the left, and pull down. So click, drag left, pull down. You're going to see this thing. We can also use our, our rolly wheel on the top of our mouse as well. So we're going over here. These are all your circuit breakers. Um, one interesting thing in all DCS is a right click is up, left click is down. So if we wanted to turn all these on, we simply right click each one in turn. Flaps, we're going to leave that alone. Pitch trim, we're going to leave alone. We have a handle for our propeller RPM. I'm just going to set that up. Our main throttle right here is uh, right here. I'm just going to crack it just a teeny tiny bit. This little thing, this is a PK. And we're going to go flap that one right there. Next thing I like to do is I like to confirm that my starter switch is uncovered. Again, I just right click to open, left click to close, and I'm going to leave my magnetos all set here. Making my way across, again, everything looks good. I always like to reset the G gauge. I'm sure this is going to show many, many different numbers by the time I get to our destination. Make my way down. I can pull this out of my way so you can see everything behind us. Looks good. Looks good. We're going to come swing over here. We're going to go ahead and set up our radios. We have a couple different things we have to deal with. Remember, we're not dealing with easy radios here, so you're going to have all sorts of new challenges. So I'm just going to hold my mouse over them and not kind of roll my mouse. As you can see, you can also click and drag up and to the right. I'm going to turn both of these switches again, and you're going to right click on them. Our frequency here is going to be set to Krasnodar Center, which is going to be a frequency of 122.0. So I'm just going to dial this in by right clicking to go that way. You can also hold your mouse over, and some of them give you the ability to wheel the mouse. This one does not. Don't forget to turn your volume up, otherwise, you're going to have a heck of a time hearing uh, whatever they're telling us. Making our way down, uh, we have our switches for the actual systems here. We have our battery, generator, ignition. We have our pitot tube. Of course, it's not that cold outside. I'm not panicking about that. We're also coming down here, some oil dilution. We have a couple switches for heaters. Uh, we don't have to worry about this too much, but basically uh, we're going to be starting right away, so I'm not going to be panicking as far as turning on my heats and stuff like that. Battery switch comes all the way up, two right clicks. Generator comes on, ignition comes on. We're going to come down here and turn on our stall warning switch. These are important. These are your radiators. Now, their current position, of they've got them all completely closed. Uh, you want to slap these things all the way to the open position, especially the oil radiator. Again, I have a button on my joystick that gives me the ability to control these because you're going to be playing with these a lot. Now, the interesting thing is as you move your way onto more complicated DCS modules, this can get easier and this can get harder, as you'll see. Carburetor heat, I'm not going to worry about at all. We're going to slap it to the off position. And we want to make sure that's off right now because, again, it's nice outside. I don't need to panic about my carburetor. Moving our way down, don't touch that. This is our control for ADF. We're going to just turn that on. Again, we're just stealing it from the guy in the back seat. Oh, by the way, there's a guy in the back seat. 
Uh, so we're going to go ahead and make sure that's set. Making our way across, uh, now we're going to go ahead and dial in our compass. But we're going to do this in, um, in just a minute. Basically what this is, is we have to tell it what our latitude is so that it can accurately uh, position everything for magnetic deviation. To check our latitude, I can just simply click on our aircraft. I pressed F10, by the way. Now it tells us that we're at a latitude of north 45, so it should be the left. And again, you can sit here and I'll drag this any which way to get the sucker all the way to 45. Again, these are things you can do while you're not running in the battery, so you don't accidentally kill your battery here. All right, we'll go ahead and throw this to 45, MK. Well, again, we want to be a magnetic compass. We'll turn it to DG mode a little later on, as you'll see. All right, we're ready to start. Starting this thing is Breeze. Um, of course, uh, like I should have said earlier, if you want a quick start in DCS, you simply press the uh, Windows button and press the Home button. doesn't matter what the aircraft is, it'll auto start. So I'm going to come down here. I'm going to go ahead and wheel my mouse towards me so it swings it to main line. And I'm going to look at my fuel pressure right here. Go ahead and pull it out, push it in. You can see it gave me a little puff of fuel pressure. Pull it out one more time, and it peaks about there. If I gave it one more blast here, you can see it basically just sits here. I'm going to go ahead and wheel my mouse away from me to the cylinders. It's pretty warm outside today, so I'm going to give it two blasts, and then I'm going to lock the primer again. I'm just wheeling my uh, scroll wheel here to set it where I need to do it. Now that that's set, we're ready to start. This aircraft is extremely easy to start. We're going to make sure our throttle is cracked just a teeny tiny bit. Again, you don't have to crank on it or anything like that. So what we're going to do is we're going to hold down the start button, and once it catches, we're going to go ahead and slap the magneto switch to the power button. The way I like to do it is I like to hold down the home key, and as soon as it catches, I just smack the magneto on. Here we go. That's it. <laughs> and we're started. Now, Russian aircraft are different. Oh, by the way, that's pretty loud. Let me go ahead and close this canopy. Control C, and it shunk, slams down, so it's nice and easy to hear me again. So now, Russian aircraft are a little unique in the way that the generators versus alternators work. And that because of that, you're actually going to notice that on this aircraft, this is my little gauge as far as my amperage, as for my voltage. I can press that button if I want to see my voltage here, in which case I got 27. You'll notice that right now I'm sitting here at about, um, I'm charging by about, let's call it a, uh, it's about six amps or so. Now, if I pull my throttle back, the generator shuts off. Now, some aircraft, fortunately, the old ones, you're going to have that problem all, all the time. Like if you fly the MiG-21 or the F-86, you're going to find that your generator will cut off if your RPM gets down too low. So it's something you want to kind of watch out for. All right, let's go ahead and get this thing on relatively at about, we'll call about 40% power. It might start blinking at you. Don't worry about it too much. Nothing bad's going on. Okay, so that's it for getting this thing started. It's really, it's not too involved. Again, a relatively straightforward aircraft to get going. For those of you who are familiar with starts and other sort of programs like Flight Simulator, it's a pretty similar experience. Things you're going to want to watch out for, and this will be some, a common theme on older aircraft, is going to be your two temperatures here. Obviously, this one at the top is going to be our oil temperature. I shouldn't say obviously, you didn't know that. And basically, we want to keep this in the green. So how do we keep it in the green? Uh, we have to keep our engine temperature under control, and that brings us to these two handles over here. This handle right here, our blue handle, is our engine cowl flaps. So this gives us the ability to open up uh, basically vents to the entire engine. Some uh, general aviation folks are familiar with those. This one over here is your oil radiator flap. We have a separate flap for the oil than we do for our main engine itself. This one's going to tell us our oil temperature. This one's going to tell us our uh, regular engine temperature. I highly recommend you leave this all the way in the forward position, the oil one. And again, we can adjust that. If we want to try to warm up faster, we could close up our cow flaps. You don't really need to. Don't worry about it. This thing heats up plenty fast unless it's the middle of the winter. Leave the oil flap all the way forward. It will not make you insane. Trust me. As you can see, we're warming up pretty darn quick here without too much effort. Another cool thing with this plane is our gas gauge is this. It'll actually swash around in the back, and you'd be amazed how fast it'll choo-choo through fuel in this thing. But now that everything's been fired up, we are actually ready to go. Normally in DCS, so what you want to do is you want to go ahead and call everybody up and sort of let them know that you're going to get started. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and press that button. We'll go to air traffic control. We'll call that and we'll request startup. Zapushk. We probably should have asked them before we started, but that's okay. Now that we're all getting nice and warmed up here, I'm going to go ahead and request taxi to the runway. Keep in mind, if you're playing with uh, multiplayer elements, uh, you might run into a situation where if you don't ask for permission, you can end up cutting off an AI or something like that. That could give you all sorts of issues. Now, fun problem with DCS is if you're not perfectly in a parking spot, they might not give you permission to go. All right, we're good to go. Now, this is the next thing that surprises a lot of people here. So I'm going to go ahead and release the brake, which is this little handle right here. And we're going to start rolling. I have no nose wheel steering. So the way a Russian aircraft works, at least this generation of Russian aircraft, is you push the rudder where you want to go, and you tap the brake to actually set yourself up in the correct direction that you want to be in. So in this case, I can actually hold the rudder, and I use just the air hitting the tail in order to get us going. Now, one of the killers of this airplane is you're going to accelerate very, very quickly. F2, by the way. 
So uh, what you want to do is before you get to a turn is gently start hitting the brakes. Now a new thing you're going to have to get used to is locking your brakes. That's something you probably have not experienced before in a lot of flight sims. Uh, they're definitely out there, but you have to be mindful of that. If I sit here and rail on the brake, I'll hear Ehh! and the thing will actually start catching. So you'll have to get used to that. And that is true for all aircraft, unless they have anti-skid systems on board. So I'm looking around, everything's pretty good. Uh, my taxiway basically is going to take me right over there to the right. I just simply release the brake and this thing just goes. Now real airplanes is, you know, you just kind of let them go and they just go on us. Let's take a look at our engine temperatures. Oil's still a little bit cool, but again, I don't want to go ripping this thing up too, too powerful here. Generally, unless you're in the yellow, you're not supposed to be doing anything too reckless here. But again, I don't have to worry about that too much. So again, we're just going to go ahead and taxi using our little thing. And one thing you're going to notice is vastly different from other flight sims is the aircraft actually bounces around on the ground a lot that's uh, something you're going to have to get a little used to i'm going to hold the brakes here give it a couple little little twists and we're good go ahead and uh, put the parking brake on and again the parking brake on this thing is very unscientific you hold this brake and there's this little switch you basically slap you let go of the brake and then you let go of it and it holds the brake in position for you i love stuff like this on the f-16 you can have a little switch over here and the c-101 you're also kind of a little switch to dictate it's a big handle that you're going to pull out again you'll see that later on now that we're sitting here and everything's uh, looking pretty good to go, uh, we can go ahead and get this thing going. We do not need flaps for takeoff. I'm going to close that hatch because we don't need it right now. I'm just going to do a quick little cockpit inspection to make sure everything is roughly what I expect it. Looks pretty good, looks pretty good, looks pretty good. We're pointing in the correct direction. I'm going to go ahead and cage my gyro real quick just to make sure it's nice and centered. The gyros do tumble a lot in DCS, and you'll have to get the hang of that. So it looks like right now my oil is coming up to temperature, and we'll go ahead and I'll get the rest of it going. Uh, we'll go ahead and fast forward a bit here. All right, everything looks like it's all nice and warmed up and ready to get going. That was only a few moments, so I'm not worried about too much. So this aircraft uh, has a pretty typical run-up. It's um, easy to do. We're going to go ahead and set the parking brake like we did there. We're going to slowly push the throttle all the way forward. Don't forget the thing might want to jump on you a little bit. Go up to maximum power. I'm going to go ahead and hold it. Ah, it wants to take off on us. Yeah, we are just so light we can't even do a proper run-up here. Normally what you'd want to do is you'd want to run it up a little bit. Then we're going to go ahead and cycle our propeller control here. Make sure that works. Looks pretty good to me. Whoa, this thing really wants to jump on you. After we do that, of course, we can come over here and do our regular old magneto check. You can see we lose a little bit of RPM. Click it back to that one, gain it back, click over to this one, lose a little bit, come back, and we are good to go. Man, the brakes on this thing do not want to work. All right, let's go bring ourselves onto the runway here. So taking this one off is a pretty straightforward experience. Uh, one of our big limiting factors is the fact that we can easily overheat the engine on this particular aircraft. So we want to be very cautious with it. We're going to hold the brakes. Okay, get ourselves all nice and lined up. We do not require any special flaps or anything like that. But what we do want to do is we want to confirm everything is in the green. Notice in that quick run up, my engine's already up to temperature. Notice my oil's up to temperature. I'm going to make sure these are pushed all the way to the open position. We're not going to do any flaps here. You want to grab the landing gear and make sure that's going to be ready to go. We are ready to go. So what we're going to do is we're going to use full power for takeoff or we're going to lift the nose off the ground uh, once we get to about 90 kilometers per hour this is kph not knots and uh, once we get to about 120 the thing should leave the ground but again it's completely dependent on everything else so i'm going to go ahead and uh, smoothly apply full power and now we're on our way now don't be surprised how much this aircraft shakes uh, 90 knots we're going to lift the front wheel off the ground and once we hit 120 the aircraft will come off the rest of the way we're going to push that nose forward. It's just a tiny bit of rudder. This thing is very sensitive. Once we know that we're safe and we're into the air, we're just going to start climbing ourselves up pretty gently here at about 170 kilometers per hour. Once we're out of runway below us, we're going to bring up the landing gear. It's a bit of a process. You actually have to slap it to the up position. You know, once the landing gear safely get into the up position, what you're going to do then is you're then going to drop the landing gear to the center position. Now, this is a little different than what you're probably used to in other aircraft, but it works fine. All right, let's go ahead and set the aircraft up for our climb. So what we're going to do is we're going to reduce RPM. We're going to bring it down to about 82%. It's considered max continuous. It's about right there. Now we're going to go ahead and reduce our main engines here, and we're going to bring it down to about 8, which is uh, going to be pretty powerful. Uh, we can't quite get max continuous. Even if I floor this thing, I can't get anywhere near the maximum power that we're going to get to so again if we want to be a little bit safer we can set it to the nominal power setting which is going to bring us down to about eight there which again is going to be right on the side it's a slightly different instrument slightly different than you've seen probably in some other aircraft before now that we're airborne i'm not going to worry too much about any of those radio calls
calls and we are on our way. So as we're climbing here, we want to be very mindful of our temperatures. Uh, right now, I notice my oil temperatures start to come up very quickly. I notice my cylinder temperatures are coming up very quickly as well, uh, which is a little nerve wracking, but nothing too, too scary. Our climb speed on this one, uh, you can pretty much get anywhere. Uh, one of the things you always want to be mindful of is the less pitch you use in the climb, the less likely you are to overheat. Yes, it's going to affect your climb speed a little bit, but it's not going to be that uh, dramatic of a change here. So we're going to enjoy a nice little climb out. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to come over here and actually click this to the next position. So we have a pretty good idea of where we're heading to next. There we go, right over on my left. So when you turn with this aircraft, it's just like any general aviation aircraft. The big difference being is everything is a lot more sensitive than you probably remember in other general aviation aircraft. Every little breath on your controls is going to make the entire aircraft vibrate. It's just something you're going to kind of have to get used to here. Trim, by the way, in DCS is a tremendously quick also. We're just going to enjoy a nice little gentle climb out. And like I said, about 200 kilometers per hour is going to give us a nice combination of cooling as well as a nice combination of climb speed. About 82% there. We're climbing pretty nice. My oil is getting just a little warm. Maybe it's a little too much of a summer day for everything. Gonna bring ourselves a little bit over to this direction. Swing it back this way. Again, gentle inputs. I can't emphasize gentle enough when you're first introduced to DCS. You're going to have to use just a little bit of right foot during the climb here, unless you've got auto rudder enabled, only on account of the fact that things tend to get a little weird. All right, so we've got ourselves a pretty good amount of power. We're doing, like I said, 82% is going to be kind of our continuous power. And we could probably bring the nose up just a tiny bit. But again, like I said, we have to be very mindful of our temperatures here. And you can see I'm right teeter-tottering on the edge of being a little too warm. If you get too warm, you got to push the nose over and you got to start cooling things off. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go ahead and trim for our nominal power setting, which is going to be a little bit slower. So I'm going to go ahead and back down my power until we get to about, let's say, about 75. Now you can see I'm about 75 right now. That's going to be right here, not 75, 7.5. Now we're going to just bring our RPM down until we get to 70%. Consider this to be your nominal power setting. So this is the, I don't have to think about overheating. I don't have to worry about anything. I can cruise at this power setting and it's still gonna give me a pretty good speed here. It's not as bad. Everything's gonna kind of cool off nice and gently and it's gonna work out fairly well for us as well. Just kind of make our way ice up nice and gently. Again, not doing anything too crazy. I can bring the nose up just a touch more. And you can see our engine's actually starting to get cold. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go ahead and close up my cow flaps just a tiny bit here. So it's gonna be this handle right here. We're just gonna go ahead and pull it back just a few notches and kind of see its impact. Remember, if the engine cools off, so does the oil. So that's also the reverse. So as our engine warms up, you'll actually see our oil temperature starting to sneak up as well, even though its flap is open. Now, a cool thing is if you actually look underneath this aircraft, you can see that right there front and center on the right where that little flap is. You can see now that we're at nominal power, this thing does not want to climb. So it's again, something you're going to have to be very mindful of when you're planning to fly this aircraft for any proper distance here. But again, everything else is cruising. Neat thing you can do in this airplane, of course, by pressing the number two, you can actually get in the back seat. And on the back seat, you've got a slightly different set of controls. You can fail key things. You can even have a little bit of fun with the pitch trim. And if you're playing multiplayer, of course, you can actually uh, make adjustments to the aircraft for the guy that's flying which is kind of dangerous if you ask me, but I think it's kind of cool too. All right, about 200 kilometers an hour. Everything's cooling off nicely. My engine, actually, we could go ahead and cool that off a little more, so I'll pull that back. And now we're looking like we're in pretty good shape. Once we get to 1,500 meters, we'll go ahead and level off and kind of make our way, and we'll take a look at the compass settings. Now, one of the nice things about this aircraft is it has a very easy trim. I don't think you're going to have too much difficulty with it as far as setting it goes, and you'll see exactly what I mean once we go ahead and level this thing off. There we go, approaching about 1,500 meters there. Just enjoying our nice gentle little climb out here. There we go, go ahead and nose over as usual. Remember, as you nose this thing over, you're gonna start picking up speed. So we're just gonna level off. We're gonna see exactly what the aircraft wants to do. Again, you're gonna find these aircraft tremendously sensitive in pitch, especially if you've come from other flight simulators. That looks pretty good there. I'm going about, let's call it, yeah, it looks pretty good. We're gonna start picking up just a little tiny bit of speed here. It's not gonna be too much. Remember, most of our excessive energy in this aircraft is going to be spent on purposes of climbing. It's not really gonna make us go fast. Yes, we can get up to 350 kilometers an hour in this aircraft, but it takes a pretty concerted effort on our part. Now, one thing I'm noticing is if you take a look right here where our little bubble is, as far as the purposes of coordinating our slip, is I have to use a pretty good amount of right foot with this to actually correct it. What we can do later on is actually experiment in the special options and set it so that we don't have to use any right foot by giving us a little bit of right rudder trim. Remember, there is no in-flight rudder trim. 
All right, so we have a couple different cruise settings on this aircraft, depending on what we want to do. Uh, right now, this is called the nominal power setting. Uh, this is basically uh, unlimited. We can do this for as long as we want without any consequence. Notice, by the way, how quickly the engine warmed up. If we want to use a little bit slower cruise setting, like we're trying to uh, really drag things out just a little bit, we can go ahead and use a 64 and 7.3, uh, which would just look a little bit like this. We go ahead and back that down. 64 and 7.3 is going to be right here. So that's going to get us a little bit uh, slower. It's going to be a little bit quieter. Like I said, I just ma accidentally mashed that button. It's going to make you take a little bit longer to get to your destination. Now, if you absolutely positively have to make this thing go really, really slow, like if you're doing some kind of loitering exercise, maybe you're doing the airborne forward or controller kind of a thing, you could even bring it all the way down to 59. Oh, I can't even bring it down that far. Let's see if I can bring it down to 670 here. Pull that down to 670, which is going to be about right there. Yeah, I can't even bring it down that low. <laughs> That's excellent. Actually, I'm sorry. It's going to be right there. Got it. Perfect. So we got a 69 and 6.7 there. It's going to be the absolute, absolute, we're barely flying kind of a cruise. But it's great if you want to cool things off in the event that they start getting a little on the warm side. Now, speaking of warm side, notice how quick it took for our engine to start getting hot again. But remember, it's our engine engine that's getting hot. So I'm actually going to open up the cow flaps, trying to desperately try to cool off the oil. So I'm going to go ahead and open them all the way and bring them back two notches, see if I can go ahead and get this thing cool. Yeah, nobody said this would be easy. This is just different. Okay, now that we're kind of cruising along and everything's looking pretty good, let's go ahead and take a look at some of the tools that we have at our disposal that makes DCS a little bit different here. And again, I'm assuming that you have some flight background here. I'm going to go ahead and swing myself gently into this direction and bring ourselves right around 240. Now, one of the things I had mentioned, and you're going to run into this in the C-101 too in the intermediate series, is the fact in this particular aircraft, uh, we have a couple little things that's going to make things a little weird for you. Uh, namely, your compass system is basically has the ability to read its magnetic position as well as a gyro position. Right now, the compass is actually, I should say, a directional gyro was actually slaved to the compass. Now, if we had some kind of really, really nasty turbulence, you'd actually watch this thing twitching around as it desperately tries to acquire the appropriate heading that we need to bring ourselves on. You're going to constantly be adjusting trim in here. Don't worry about it too much. So what we can actually do is come over here on this aircraft and we can switch it to directional gyro mode only. And by hitting that switch that we just hit a moment ago, this is only a directional gyro. It has no updates from the compass at all, which means every 15 minutes or so, what's going to happen is it's going to slowly start to drift on us, meaning that we're going to have to adjust it in order to keep it basically where we want to be heading towards. So if I wanted to, I can come back here, slap that button, and it's going to go ahead and reline up with whatever our compass setting is. And again, that only matters if we're going slow enough to make it actually work for us in that particular regard. Okay, next thing we want to take a look at is we want to take a look at the F-10 map. Now, one of the great things is that we have this beautiful map, and if you set your stuff correctly, we can actually come onto this map. Keep in mind, you're still flying, so if you're flying into the ground, you're still flying into the ground. You can actually go up to the top here, grab Show Ruler, and you can actually position things on the chart so you can see exactly where you want to go. For example, if I want to head to Krimsk, I need to head at a, a two, five, six degree true. Now, the interesting thing, oh, did you notice the directional gyro just twitched? Do you see it? That's the magnetic compass uh, trying to align things up for us. We can always disable that if we don't need to. Now, I noticed that it was 256 was the true heading. Now, for those of you who are familiar with true versus magnetic, notice how much of a pain in the butt this can possibly be. So if I were to align ourselves perfectly at 256 degrees, I'd actually be off magnetically. So what we're actually going to do here is we're going to bring ourselves up to about 250 degrees because of the six degrees of difference between magnetic variation and uh, obviously your true position that you're traveling on. Now, the other thing you probably notice as I'm flying here is right down here where my ADF needle is, is it's been pointing where we want to go the whole time. Now you're sitting there going, wait a minute, how did you do that? Well, if you remember in the actual mission setup, we actually programmed the frequencies by default in here to this frequency here of 408 and this frequency here of 803. So since we put it under channel two, I can just come down here, set this to channel two, like I've done, make sure the compass control is on, and then I can literally just follow where I want to go. Now, the interesting thing about Russian systems, and you'll see this sometimes in really, really old school American aircraft too, is you'll have two different compass modes. You'll have what they call the inner and outer markers. Now, what this simply means is the outer marker refers to the NDB that's farthest away, and the inner marker refers to the NDB that's actually closest. So what I can actually do here is I can flip the switch, and it will switch between those two settings, assuming that I set them properly inside the simulator itself. So what we're going to do now is we're just going to kind of proceed all the way to our destination. The aircraft is uh, running very smoothly. It looks like I have 45 liters in the front and 50 liters in the back. We start wiggling the controls around, of course. Uh, things will start getting a little weird to us. Uh, once we get to the airport itself, I'll kind of walk you through kind of the process of landing this aircraft so you can be familiar, at least at the absolute basic level. 
All right, we've got ourselves in a pretty good position here. Looking over my right wing, I can see my target airfield. So what we're gonna go ahead and do is we're gonna go ahead and gently reduce our power. And bring it down to about four. And we're also gonna go ahead and close up some of our cow flaps here. We, uh, since uh, whenever you reduce power significantly, we wanna keep the engine fairly warm. You probably don't need to close the cow flaps completely like I did. A lot of times you can crack it. I highly recommend leaving the oil cooler open because uh, again, uh, you don't need to worry about that too, too much. But again, you'll find that just once you set it, you don't have to worry about it unless it's freezing outside. Okay, so uh, one big difference between a Russian aircraft, and as you'll see as well with um, a regular uh, Western aircraft, is this is calibrated in meters per second as opposed to feet per minute. Basically, if you want a translation, if you're doing three, which is going to be this line here, that's roughly the equivalent of uh, 500 feet per minute, if you want to kind of think of it a different way. So landing this aircraft is done basically the same exact way that you've probably seen in other pieces as well. Um, what we're going to do is we're simply going to reduce our speed all the way down to the speed we need to land at, and we're just going to be a little gentle with it, because in DCS, those first couple landings can be a little on the bumpy side. And there's an airfield. Again, it's a military airfield. Hence, you got those uh, big bunkers right there, which in the future we'll be dropping all sorts of nasty bombs on to kind of go ahead and uh, you know, make their day kind of a thing. As usual, uh, if you've uh, flown in the West, you're very familiar with all the things as far as traffic patterns goes. If you're brand new to flying, uh, basically what a traffic pattern does is a standard pattern entry that we're going to use for the purposes of uh, going ahead and landing the aircraft. Keep in mind when we move on to some of the other aircraft, the jets, we'll be doing overhead approaches, which are basically brake approaches for like minimum distance. In this particular case today, I'm not worried about this too too much so what we're going to do is we're basically going to fly parallel with the runway bring ourselves parallel like that unfortunately there's no wind today so i'm not worried about it too much there we are now that i'm parallel with the runway we're just going to kind of scoot along here don't have to worry about it too much we're a bit high but that's all right we're going to looking for a speed of about 160 knots is our approach speed get to the end of the runway here Again, it's going to be the exact same process uh, for those of you who are familiar with regular general aviation planes. There we are, about 160. Looking pretty good. Let's take a look at our temperatures. Our engines are literally perfect. All right, we're going to start descending now. You're looking for about 300 meters per second. Now, we're coming down a little fast here on account of the fact that we're a little high, but that's all right. And we're basically looking for the point where the runway is about 45 degrees, which is right there. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and take our general base leg here. So I'm going to take a left turn. Make sure you're quick with the feet here. And we're basically going to bring ourselves perpendicular to the runway. There we are. We're going to go ahead and bring ourselves around, drop our landing gear. We're also going to set our RPM to full. Remember with this aircraft, it's going to be two presses to drop your landing gear, not one. Kick the nose over. Go ahead and put your RPM all the way up to full. And now we are ready to land this plane. So this aircraft has landed just like anything you've ever flown before. There's nothing too unique to it, except the moment you cut the power on the engine, the aircraft will stop flying. Uh, some of you are familiar with aircraft that do this, but in DCS, everything is drastically more sensitive. We're going to go ahead and increase power a little bit here. I want to be doing about a 160 on the descent here. I'm actually going to open up my cow flaps all the way here. Because again, we're going to be under high power if we have to go around. I'm slipping just a teeny tiny bit to make it easier to see where I'm going. We're just going to line ourselves up at the end of the runway just like that. Again, 160 is the magic speed. And now here's the trick. You're going to want to slowly reduce your throttle. Don't just pull it back to zero. Slowly reduce it. Level yourself up over the runway. And kill the power. Nose up. And we're waiting for the bump. This aircraft is going to be really sensitive. There it goes. Now hold back on the control when you hit the ground initially, because you don't want to go like that. All right, we're down. I'm going to go and gently press the brakes. Give ourselves a little tiny bit of throttle to keep the generator running. And there we have it. Now we've uh, gone ahead and give ourselves a complete basic circle with this aircraft. And again, the whole purpose of this video is just kind of let you get kind of an introduction to DCS and see how things are as far as uh, what they look like, as far as how the controls are. I highly recommend spending a lot of time with this aircraft just for the purposes of getting used to how sensitive things are, especially in pitch. And our next video, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at doing some basic maneuvers with this airplane, you know, acrobatics, if you want to kind of think about it another sort of way, so that when we move on to the more quicker aircraft, you're going to be more familiar with it. Enjoy.